Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Welcome everyone to bilingualism again. And today we'll talk about uh, dichotomies and characteristics of bilingualism in this lecture. Uh, bilingualism is the ability to understand and or use two or more languages. So it means that uh, uh, bilingualism uh, is not restricted only to the use and understanding of uh, uh, only two languages. Uh, uh, rather, it encompasses multilingualism, which is the knowledge and use of uh, more than two languages or several languages. Uh, the languages in question uh, may be uh, spoken languages and uh, spoken languages, sign languages or a combination of both spoken and sign languages. Uh, however, as uh, language is a dynamic, complex social tool uh, developed over extended period, so it does not have a straightforward definition. So an adult can be bilingual from childhood or become bilingual by acquiring another language or languages later in his life uh, due to many factors such as social interests, working related activities, migration uh, and so on. Uh, since bilingual person uh, may routinely use his languages in different contexts uh, for different purposes, uh, for example uh, home life and education or work etc. Uh, he may therefore not have the same communicative skills in uh, both his languages or all his languages uh, he, he, can, he can use or understand. Uh, some of the main features of bilingualism uh, are that bilingualism is a proficiency in two or more languages. So proficiency in understanding or in spoken or in both, uh, both skills. Uh, bilingualism is evident in all the four skills uh, of a language, uh, uh, like uh, reading, uh, uh, writing, speaking and listening. And 50% of the uh, world's population is bilingual. Okay, let's see here the dichotomies of uh, bilingualism. So, uh, you may have seen this uh, particular uh, slide in your previous lecture as well. So, because we mentioned uh, it uh, briefly in the introduction of uh, bilingualism. Uh, today, again, uh, let's see them in a bit more detail. The study of bilingualism has tended to develop dichotomies types. Okay. Uh, among the more commonly used dichotomies are distinctions between compound and coordinate bilingualism, simultaneous and successive bilingualism, elite and folk bilingualism. So these distinctions you know, have had an important function in drawing attention to various aspects of bilingualism, but at the same time they represent different approaches to the question of bilingualism. Uh, all right, let's begin with the consecutive versus simultaneous bilingualism. Uh, consecutive or successive bilingualism uh, refers to learning one language after already knowing another language. So this is the situation for all those who become bilinguals as uh, adults as well as for many who became bilinguals earlier in life. Uh, sometimes uh, it is called consecutive bilingualism and sometimes successive bilingualism. Uh, simultaneous bilingualism refers to learning two languages as first languages. So yeah, this is something interesting that two first is somebody's first language is not one language but two. So that is uh, a person, I mean, how does it happen? That when a person who is simultaneous bilingual 
goes from speaking no languages at all uh, directly to speaking two languages. So, for example, you can think uh, about infants uh, who are exposed to two languages from birth uh, will become simultaneous bilinguals. I mean, if uh, infants uh, are exposed to two languages, uh, for example, you know, uh, two parents, they have different uh, mother uh, tongues. So, in this case, infants may uh, may acquire both of these languages simultaneously together and become simultaneous uh, speakers or uh, uh, simultaneous bi uh, bilinguals. Uh, receptive bilingual, uh, uh, this is also, uh, I, I don't know, I don't know, I should call it uh, bilingual or not, uh, because uh, it refers to being able to refer, understand two languages, but express one, uh, oneself in only one. So he can understand two languages, but he can express himself only in one language. I mean, he can speak or he can use, he can write on only in one language, but he can understand two languages. So this is generally not considered true bilingualism. So generally, this is not considered a true bilingual uh, person, but it's fairly common situation. So it's not uh, uh, under true um, uh, um, umbrella of uh, bilingualism, but uh, it is fairly very common situation. I mean, I, I, uh, I think um, uh, we all agree and we all see all around us people who, who who can understand more than one languages but they cannot uh, speak those languages for example many people can understand English and Urdu but they can speak only Urdu no English and in other local languages also you, you may have seen uh, such situation so this is not uh, considered a true bilingualism but anyway this is a very very common situation in the society, especially in our society. Yes, uh, bilingual uh, bilingualism. We we are comparing uh, two different types of uh, bilingualism. Simultaneous and simultaneous bilingualism. So both language one and language two they are uh, learned together. And in consecutive. So language one is learned uh, first and after learning first language, uh, uh, second language is uh, learned or acquired. So most bilinguals in the world are uh, consecutive bilinguals. Okay? Most bilinguals are, oh, sorry, this side, on the right side, consecutive. Simultaneous uh, uh, bilinguals, as we just said, that they're very rare. So anyway, yeah. And second point here is that no, like, I mean, no two human beings are alike. Uh, you may say in the same way that no two bilinguals are alike in the, in terms of proficiency or other characteristics. There must be some differences between two bilinguals. So in consecutive uh, uh, bilingualism. So language, first language is learned first and second language is uh, learned second and their level is not the same. You know, uh, contradictory to simultaneous uh, bilingual, uh, bilingualism, uh, the level of or the standard of uh, uh, our proficiency of uh, both the languages is not the same. And studies have shown that features of language one can have powerful influence on L2. Even the features of uh, first language, the, the interference of first language uh, is very, very, I mean, it, it strongly affects uh, the learning of language too. Like, I mean, we, uh, uh, because our first language is uh, not English, so while uh, producing English language, I mean, we, uh, our uh, the interference of our first 
language is very strong and our accent on our product of English language is not the same as uh, as is uh, the product of the native speakers of that uh, of English language so this is because of uh, uh, the interference of our first language features which uh, powerfully or strongly influence uh, the learning process of language too so and second language one transfer can be positive or negative you know so this uh, interference of language one can be can affect the learning of language two positively or negatively i think i mean uh, maybe in we if we learn arabic you know uh, the the uh, interference of our first language may positively affect uh, the learning of language two but if we uh, talk about learning a second language uh, english as second language so it may be negative uh, in simultaneous uh, bilingualism uh, le both language one and language two they are learned together and their uh, proficiency uh, is also uh, the same and studies examining two simultaneous bilinguals are very rare you know, they are rare, rarely you see that uh, simultaneous bilinguals. And brain imaging studies, I mean, this is also a uh, neurological uh, field of study, they show that uh, are spread in activation across left and right hemispheres. So there are two hemispheres in the brain uh, which are responsible for different functions of language. So brain imaging studies, they've shown are spread in activation across uh, both the left and right hemispheres in the brain. Uh, so this is another topic uh, we may learn in uh, this in uh, uh, cognitive uh, topic uh, if we find if we have uh, in the coming uh, weeks. Um, next is uh, we will talk about uh, early uh, bilingualism and versus late bilingualism. So early age of bilingual uh, exposure has uh, a significant impact on multiple aspects of child's development, like linguistic aspect, cognitive and reading aspects. So early age bilingual uh, exposure, it has a strong impact on many aspects, uh, like linguistic aspect or cognitive aspect. Uh, or reading aspect, reading ability of uh, child's uh, development. So this is the uh, effect of early age bilingualism. Uh, children uh, who experience early and extensive exposure to both of their languages quickly grasp the fundamentals of both of their languages and in a manner similar to that of monolingual language learning. So that means that ch uh, children who, uh, who experience uh, early uh, in their age the extensive uh, exposure to, um, to both, I mean they, uh, they come across uh, both the languages very deeply okay, and in their early age uh, so they, they quickly grasp the fundamentals of both those, of those languages uh, in a manner that uh, that the similar that of monolingual language learner like you know um, where, like uh, mono language learners they quickly grasp the fundamental of their mono, uh, their uh, mother tongue monoling monolingual mean uh, uh, people who speak one language so when they learn their first mother tongue so they they quickly grasp the fundamentals of their mother tongue and similarly, children who experience extensive exposure of, uh, of both uh, languages, so they also behave like monolingual language learners with both uh, with the fundamentals of both of those languages that they, they come across in, in their early age. Uh, here we have uh, the categorizing, uh, categorizing bilingual acquisition. Uh, 
by the age at which the two languages are acquired, uh, people become uh, bilinguals at, at which stages of li uh, their lives are here, infants, child, adolescent. Uh, um, the infant bilingual acquisition uh, involves the child learning two languages almost simultaneously from the outside. Sometimes this results from having parents uh, who have different native languages uh, but also speak the other parents' uh, language as I just said in uh, the previous slide. Uh, however, uh, child bilingual acquisition may start quite early in life but involves the successive acquisition of two languages as do adolescents and adult bilingualism. So, an adolescent bilingual uh, acquisition uh, refers to the acquisition of a second language after puberty and uh, adult bilingual acquisition uh, refers to acquisition after the teen years. So early learners of a second language uh, can speak uh, like a native speaker and late learners make faster progress in acquiring uh, morphosyntactic and semantic aspects of a second language. So this is the difference that early learners, they can speak like a native speaker, but they don't uh, uh, understand the depth of their language uh, so much as the late learners uh, do. They understand, they acquire uh, morphosyntactic and semantic aspects of a language better than early learners. Next is balanced versus dominant bilinguals. Uh, balanced bilingual uh, refers to someone whose mastery of two languages is roughly equ equivalent. I mean, um, he has uh, proficiency or mastery of uh, both of his languages or um, both or more than two languages at uh, the equal level. So roughly equivalent uh, proficiency in all uh, the languages he, he understands or speaks. And dominant uh, bilingual uh, means r someone with greater proficiency in one of his uh, or her languages and uses it significantly more than the other language. So he's, uh, uh, he has a strong uh, a stronger proficiency in one language and he uses it more, more, more significantly than, than the other language, uh, than the second uh, language. And semilingual uh, refers to someone with insufficient knowledge of either language. So any, if he has uh, insufficient knowledge of uh, any one language, so he may be called a semilingual. Uh, yes, here, uh, now we will see uh, the types of process, uh, processes in becoming bilinguals. Uh, I mean, in other words, what happens when uh, you become uh, bilingual? So there are some types uh, of people, uh, certain things happen with those people, what happens, let's see, one by one. Uh, number one, we will see uh, additive bilingualism. So additive, so you gain a second language and you retain a first language also. So I mean, you gain second language and you keep your first language intact. Okay, so it doesn't, uh, it's not affected by the learning of uh, uh, the second language. Acquisition of a second language is treated as an asset. So. In additive bilingualism, you simply add a second language, okay, to your abilities and uh, without affecting your first language. Okay, subtractive uh, bilingualism, uh, you lose fluency of a uh, first language when acquiring a second language. So in uh, these types of uh, bilinguals, uh, they lose fluency of their first language when they acquire the second language. And special heritage language schools can help children 
maintain the language and culture of their parents. Okay. Uh, and additive bilinguals, the learning of second language does not interfere with the learning of a first language. Both languages are well developed. And subtractive bilingual, uh, the learning a second language interferes with the learning of a first language. The second language replaces the first language. Very strange, you know. Uh, you learn a uh, second language and it replaces uh, your first language. So additive or subtractive bilingualism is related to the different status associated with the two languages in our society. I mean, this uh, subtractive bilingualism, uh, you may uh, you you may feel strange. I mean, how how this can happen? But if you see, you know, I have uh, come across some some people from UK. Uh, they are uh, Pakistani based, and their uh, uh, mother tongue is Punjabi or Kashmiri or Urdu or something, uh, any Pakistani language. But, you know, and that is spoken also there. They learn this language in their childhood and, and, and their homes. But later on, when they learn English, okay, uh, so they, they, they lose uh, fluency in, in their first language. So this is one example that just, just came into my mind. And there may be some other cases also. If you have some uh, experiences, experiences, such experiences, you can share with the class. Uh, An additive or subtractive bilingualism is related to different status associated with the two languages in our society. So they have uh, different status also in additive or subtractive bilingualism. If you learn uh, a language that has a higher status in the society, I mean uh, it has a different status and if you you lose, uh, I mean, sometimes you lose also a uh, minor language or a language that has uh, a lower status in the society. So for uh, status uh, 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 purpose, you may, you may deliberately uh, uh, subtract your first language as well. I mean, like many people here, they do not speak their mother tongue but uh, they speak Urdu. <coughs> they speak Urdu, I think. They speak Urdu for um, status purpose only. Okay. Uh, as, uh, uh, it may be different in different contexts. Now we will uh, talk about elite uh, bilingualism and folk uh, sorry, we are talking about bilinguals now, not bilingualism. So what happens uh, in the process when people become elite bilingual and when people become folk bilinguals? Okay, first elite uh, bilinguals. Uh, are elite bilinguals are uh, uh, the individuals who choose to have a bilingual home often in order to enhance social status. Of course, elite bilinguals, they are not uh, uh, oppressed by circumstances. They are not pushed by any, any needs or any uh, obligation. They just choose to, be, to become bilingual, uh, bilinguals because of uh, their, uh, to enhance their social status. You know, some people, I mean, this is uh, 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 also... Uh, a social matter. I mean, if you know more than one language, I mean, you enjoy a higher status than people who can speak only one language, and they can, uh, they are unable to uh, to speak or to use uh, more than one language. And folk bilinguals are the individuals who develop second language capacity under circumstances. Uh, that are not often of their own choosing and in conditions uh, uh, where the society does not value their native language. So it may be because of the circumstances, okay, and they are not often there. They, I mean, this is not their own choice. I mean, they do not choose uh, just for, as a fun, but they are, their circumstances uh, are 
I mean, uh, there may be economic circumstances and many things we will talk about them later on. And uh, sometimes society does not value their native language, so they do not use it. So if you think honestly, okay, many uh, local languages are not, uh, 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 not uh, valued by the society, our society, and we do not, even they are our mother tongue, other languages but we do not speak them because of this uh, uh, social uh, restriction uh, so this is also uh, one of the aspects of um, uh, bilingual process uh, <laughs> here uh, this uh, light slide so moving between languages how do we translate between two languages you see in our uh, in our brain, it is hello, H E L L, -L O, and what we produce is hola. So maybe this is our uh, mother tongue, hello, and this is uh, uh, the second language. So we think about what does it mean. So we think about our first language and then we produce the uh, second language. And here, the same case with apple. Uh, yes, now this is the second part of the lecture today. Uh, the, there are four essential characteristics of bilingualism. Uh, bilingualism is a relative concept which involves the question of degree, function, alteration, and interference. So it involves these things, okay, bilingualism concept it involves these four main characteristics degree so we will talk about them in detail one by one degree uh, the first and most obvious thing uh, to do in describing a person's bilingualism is to determine is to determine how bilingual he is because the uh, bilingual may not have an equal mastery for all four basic skills in both languages. So, uh, therefore, it's important to test each of these skills separately if we are to get a picture of the extent of his bilingualism. If you want to, uh, to have a picture of you know, how, how uh, perfect or how uh, proficient he is, uh, proficient bilingual he is we we have to uh, test each of these skills separately but if we are only interested in determining his bilingualism rather than in describing it okay we just need to determine it whether, whether I mean he is bilingual or not and we don't need to describe his bilingualism so other forms of tests are also possible like I mean, we can just uh, communicate him we can just uh, ask him, we can interview him, we can ask him different things, okay, and just guess him and uh, he can, uh, he's a bilingual or he can communicate to some extent. Or some other forms of tests uh, may also be available there. Uh, but the bilingual's mastery of a skill, however, may not be the same at all linguistic levels. Of course, so he may be good at one scale and not as good at different scales. And uh, finally, uh, a bilingual uh, familiarity with the stylistic range of each language is very likely to vary with the subject of the discourse. For example, in uh, the subject of the discourse uh, you are good at, you are interested in, so your familiarity of the stylistic range may be better than the other uh, subjects there which are unknown or which are, are you are not interested in. Uh, to get an accurate description of the degree of bilingualism, different types of models of language tests have not been developed. So now we will uh, talk about the function, the, the role of function so what's uh, uh, the role of function and uh, and the, and the degree of proficiency of uh, 
uh, of each language that a bilingual uh, uses or understands. So the degree of proficiency in each language depends on uh, its function. So the function is the base of the degree. So if uh, that is on the use to which the bilingual puts the language and the conditions under which he has used it. So uh, it means that in which condition uh, uh, for which function the language is used that determines the degree uh, of, uh, of uh, proficiency of that uh, bilingual. So these functions may be external or internal. So let's see them now one uh, extern external functions first we will talk about. Uh, the external functions of bilingualism uh, are determined by the number of areas of contact and by the variation of each of uh, the areas of contact in duration, frequency and pressure. So these uh, the areas of contact include all media through which the language were acquired and used and the amount of influence of each of these on the language habits of the bilingual uh, depends on the duration, frequency and pressure of the contact. So the, how much uh, influence uh, uh, of uh, uh, the areas of contact uh, comes on the language habit depends on the duration of the contact and the frequency of the contact and the pressure of the contact. So these may apply to two types of activities either on comprehension uh, as well as uh, uh, expression. So uh, these uh, things may apply on both I mean, in understanding the language or and using the language as well. I mean listening as well or I mean not listening only just comprehend, comprehending and understanding and, uh, and expressing that language also in the form of speaking or in writing. Uh, the bilinguals uh, language contacts may be uh, with the languages used in the home community, school, mass media, and uh, correspondence. We just said, I mean, all types of media uh, that uh, he, the bilingual uh, acquired language from. So that is uh, all types of media. Uh, it means that uh, the lang uh, home, community, school, mass media, and any kind of correspondence through which the language is acquired. Uh, and contacts with each of the above may vary in in terms of duration, frequency, and pressure, and they may also vary in the use of each language for comprehension only, or for both comprehension and uh, expression. So there must be uh, variation in in contacts in terms of uh, duration, frequency, and pressure for uh, comprehension only or for both comprehension and expression. Yeah, let's see uh, the influence of uh, duration. Uh, the amount of influence uh, of any area of contact on bilingualism of uh, uh, the individual depends on the duration of the contact. For example, a 40 years old bilingual who spent uh, all his life in a foreign neighborhood is definitely uh, to know the language better than uh, one who has been there for only for a few years. So duration uh, has a, a strong or significant uh, influence uh, on, uh, uh, on the acquisition of uh, uh, language. Uh, frequency. Uh, the duration of contact is not significant, however, so, unless we know its frequency. So we know the duration, okay, but so if we do not know its frequency, so, so it, it, it will be void. I mean, the duration of uh, the contact will not be significant. 
frequency for the spoken language may be measured in average contact hours per week or month uh, for the written language it may be measured in average number of words for example uh, duration a person lived in uh, in a foreign country for 40 years but he lived in, in in jail or in somewhere where he had no contact okay so so he had no contact with the language uh, uh, with the spoken language or written language okay so if we do not know the frequency so duration would be uh, not significant so uh, frequency of spoken language can be measured um, in average for example uh, average contact hours per week or per month or per year uh, whatsoever and for written language we cannot say when written he wrote for one hour or two hours because uh, speed uh, varies from person to person so uh, written language can be measured uh, in average number of words and pressure uh, in each of the areas of contact there may be a number of pressures which influence the bilinguals in the use of one language rather than the other so pressure so these may be uh, uh, these may be uh, economic uh, administrative cultural political mil military historical religious or demographic pressures so types of pressures so we will see these types of pressures uh, one by one here uh, economic pressure what is this uh, kind of uh, pressure uh, for speakers of a minority language in an ethnic community the knowledge of the majority language may be an economic necessity so you can understand this I mean, that speakers of the majority language okay uh, like uh, in Lahore you see people coming from KPK, they start speaking uh, Punjabi language, although their uh, <laughs> Punjabi language is very strange for, for uh, common people in KPK. I mean, they cannot even understand, but the people who work here uh, in this society, I mean, they, they speak just like, uh, I mean, they speak in Lahori accent, rather, uh, the Punjabi language. Uh, administrative uh, pressure administrative workers in some areas are required to master a second language uh, this is a very common phenomena I mean in uh, administrative workers they must uh, I mean most of the companies they require their employees to to master uh, English language especially these days uh, this is a lingua franca uh, uh, this is a lingua franca uh, in, in the world today so everybody uh, asks their employees uh, to be efficient in English language or in Pakistan at least I mean uh, last uh, a, a few months ago I read news about that about that in, in, in our offices uh, employees in government office employees speak Punjabi everywhere so they should speak uh, Urdu so there should be a law uh, to make people speak Urdu in, uh, in offices. Uh, anyway, I mean, this is a, is a kind of uh, administrative pressure, uh, which uh, uh, is an important characteristic of uh, bilingualism. Uh, cultural uh, bilingualism, in some countries it may be essential for cultural reasons for any educated person to be fluent in one or more foreign languages. Uh, what what do you think? I mean, if anybody here in our society uh, he's educated and he doesn't speak uh, English, the, the people I mean uh, and culturally, so he, he he must be undervalued. People will say oh, he doesn't know anything. He has no knowledge. So so this is uh, this kind of pressure is cultural uh, uh, cultural uh, pressure. 
which uh, forces people to become uh, bilinguals. All right, uh, so we were talking about, actually, there was an interruption. Uh, I think we were talking about cultural pressures, yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, next is number four, uh, political pressure. The use of uh, uh, certain languages may be maintained by the pressure of political circumstances. So there may be some any need of uh, uh, certain languages because of uh, some political needs. So and they are maintained and they are taught, or people are um, forced to learn those languages for political uh, grounds, for political reasons. Uh, military pressure: a bilingual who enters the armed forces of his country. Uh, may be placed in uh, situations which require him to hear or speak a second language more often than uh, he otherwise would. Uh, because, uh, that, uh, because of the uh, military need, uh, sometimes there is a military need pressure uh, to learn a second language. Uh, I mean, if there were no military pressure, so that person would have uh, not uh, acquired that language. Uh, historical pressure, the languages are uh, uh, bilingual learners uh, and the extent to which he must learn them may have been determined by past historical events. Uh, if the language of a minority has been protected by a treaty, it may, it may mean that the minority can require its children to be educated in their own language. So if there is uh, as protected by uh, any, any treaty, so it, it may mean that the minority uh, can require its children, I mean they can require, because they have to protect its language because of that treaty, so they have to teach that language uh, to their children. Uh, uh, religious, uh, pressure, a bilingual uh, may become fluent in a language for purely religious reasons. Uh, a person entering a religious order may have to learn Latin, Greek, Coptic, Sanskrit and Arabic. Of course, I mean, this is a very straightforward. Uh, I mean, everybody can understand it easily for religious reason. Uh, people have to learn uh, and the source language uh, languages of uh, their religions. Uh, demographic, the number of persons with whom the bilingual has the likelihood of coming into contact. So demographic, I mean the number of persons, for example, he, he, uh, he expect or he may be in contact uh, with the people of uh, uh, people of uh, uh, different languages so this is also uh, a kind of pressure because he needs to talk to people of different languages so he, he has to master those languages so this kind of pressure is uh, called a demographic pressure uh, so apart from external functions there are internal functions uh, as well uh, bilingualism is not only related to external factors is also connected with internal ones. Uh, so these uh, functions uh, include non-communicative uses, uh, for example, internal speech, you speak with new self, and the expression of intrinsic aptitude, uh, which influence the bilingual's ability to resist or profit by the situations with which he comes in contact. Uh, a person's, uh, uh, so now we have uses here. A person's bilingualism is reflected uh, in the internal uses of each of his languages. Some bilinguals may use one and the same language for all sorts of inner expressions. Uh, for inner expressions, 
that are, they use the uh, same language for all inner expression. And some use uh, different languages, and both languages are there. Sometimes, uh, like, you know, uh, uh, some people, you know, <laughs> when they are angry, they, they speak English, or they shout in English and, and, and to be polite. Uh, some people, they shout in their mother tongue or in, uh, in, in Urdu, okay, this is the kind of thing. Uh, this uh, language has often been identified as the dominant language of the bilingual. Uh, there is an example also, I mean, if you, uh, there was a person, there is a story actually. There was a person, uh, he was, uh, he knew so many languages, or many languages, and uh, uh, he, he challenged people, I mean, to identify what is my mother tongue. So people tried and he was master of every language, so nobody could recognize what or identify what uh, um, language was his uh, native language. Uh, there was a wise old man also, he came up uh, to accept a challenge, accepted a challenge and came up and he asked him okay to to go up on, on a ladder upstairs, uh, I mean ladder of uh, you know uh, the wooden ladder up. Uh, when he was going up, you know by some, somehow he pushed him and he fell down and he started abusing in a language and that old man said, this is your uh, mother tongue. So then he agreed, he accepted it. He said, he said yes, that's it. I mean, in, in extreme situations, actually, uh, we use our mother tongue. But some people, you know, uh, when, uh, you know, they shout in English, and his, my English is not his mother tongue, I mean, he's just, uh, let's say, uh, pausing, uh, or acting, even, but uh, this uh, he's not in that extreme situation. But he's showing that I am very angry. But actually, he's not that much angry. But if he was, uh, if he were true angry, I mean, <laughs> the, the the language would have been different than English. There, if he was not English, uh, right. Uh, this language has often been identified as the dominant language of the bilingual. I mean, whatever language he used for his. Uh, uh, inner expressions as uh, known as or identified as the dominant language of the bilingual. Uh, other uses include diary writing, counting, praying. I mean, you use your languages. I mean, maybe in diary writing you use English. You don't. Uh, you are a Urdu speaker, a native Urdu speaker. But in your diary writing, you write in English, or maybe you write in Urdu. Uh, counting for counting, you know, sometimes, you know, in, in class also. Uh, sometimes when you need to count, you just count. So you, you start, uh, you are speaking English, okay, and when you count, you start counting in, in Punjabi or in Urdu, and then you come back to English, <laughs> okay. But of course, you count uh, not loudly, you count si silently so that people don't know that you, are, you cannot count uh, fluently in English. Anyway, and in praying also, yeah, when you are praying uh, 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 with uh, uh, deeply, so you, you 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 pray in in your mother tongue, okay. But when you pray publicly or you are leading the prayers, okay, and prayer I means supplications, so you, uh, you 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 may use uh, national language or lingua franca. Or some other uh, 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 popular language of the area. Uh, aptitude. Uh, in describing bilingualism, it's important to determine all those factors which are likely to influence the bilingual's aptitude in the use of his languages or which in turn may be influenced by it. So these may be listed uh, as follows here, uh, uh, like uh, you have here first one, gender. If a gender is a factor in language development, as past research into the issue seems to indicate, because past research indicates that gender is one of the factors uh, that has uh, played this role in language development, then 
So it's also a factor in bilingualism because I mean, if it's a factor in language development, so why not this is uh, an effective factor in, in bilingualism? So this is according to, uh, you can see this is a long name actually, uh, it's uh, P. Land Lambert in 1962, I think. Uh, right. Uh, another factor is age. Uh, persons who become bilingual in childhood may have characteristics of proficiency and usage different from those who become bilingual as adults. Of course, you know, if you become uh, bilingual in your childhood, of course, you will be more fluent than the ones who became bilingual as adults. So it does, however, show a great deal of forgetting on the part of the child. Uh, in, indeed, the child's reputed ability to remember is matched by his ability to forget. Uh, for him to be a bilingual may simply mean a transition period from one native language to another. So for, for uh, a child, uh, the bilingual uh, may simply mean transition from one uh, native language to another. I mean, there is no difference for, uh, uh, for a child bilingual. Uh, to, uh, to move from one language to another as compared to adult, adult bilingual. Because child uh, would be more fluent or he, he's just, he would be just native like because he, he may have learned both of uh, the languages as his uh, first languages. As his first languages. Uh, intelligence. Uh, Although it seems safe to include intelligence as a factor in bilingualism, uh, so it's safe, we can say so that intelligence is a very important factor to become bilingual, uh, to become a bilingual. So, but we have as yet been unable to discover its relative importance. So its relative importance has not been uh, discovered yet. So experimental research into the problem, uh, or, I mean, uh, to identify the intelligence as uh, uh, as a, an important factor for, uh, in becoming bilingual uh, person. So this is the problem. Uh, experimental research into the problem has mostly been limited to selected samples of persons of the same intellectual level. So because, you know, uh, uh, here they say that whatever experimental research has been done so far, so there uh, uh, the sampling, uh, uh, the people of uh, different uh, intelligence capacity were not included. Uh, all the people uh, that were included in, in the experimental research for uh, to measure the effect of uh, intelligence in becoming bilingualism were uh, samples were selected of the same uh, same intellectual level so that's why i mean we have not uh, uh, discovered uh, uh, this, uh, and the relative importance of intelligence uh, in uh, to become bilingual memory uh, if memory is a factor or in imitation uh, it is also a factor in bilingualism. So if memory, of course, is a factor in imitation. So you imitate uh, images of language or okay, uh, words or uh, um, so everything uh, on memory. So it's also a factor of bilingualism. So for the auditory memory span for sounds, immediately after hearing them is related to the ability to learn language. For the auditory memory span for sounds so that uh, uh, immediately after hearing them it is related to the ability to learn language also uh, the attitude of a bilingual uh, towards his languages and towards the people who speak them uh, will uh, definitely influence his behavior within different areas of contact in which each language is used. So therefore, the attitude of the speaker 
may be regarded as an important factor uh, in the description of his bilingualism. Uh, motivation. Uh, it, seems it seems obvious that uh, the motivation for acquiring the first language is more compelling than uh, the motivation for uh, learning a second. Means that the motivation for learning the first language is more, I mean, uh, people are more motivated or children are more motivated to learn their first language uh, as compared to learning the second language. Um, because for uh, once the vital purpose of communication has been achieved, I mean, you, you have achieved the purpose of communication, you can communicate uh, in one language. So the reason for repeating the effort in another language uh, are less urgent, of course. I mean, so you, you don't have so much pressure uh, of learning second language as uh, of the first language. Uh, in the case of simultaneous childhood bilingualism, however, however the need for learning both languages may, uh, may be made equally compelling because the, uh, the simultaneous bilinguals they learn uh, both languages at the same time, of course, uh, their motivation would also be the same for both these languages. And moreover, they do, they do not have any way of uh, uh, communication uh, so far. So that's why so, uh, the motivation level for both the languages uh, they learn at that time would be the same. Uh, and this is not the case with the person, uh, with people who become bilingual as an adult because these people uh, already have learned one language and they're learning the second language. So the motivation uh, pressure is not that much for them uh, to learn the second language as compared to, uh, to, uh, to the language they learned, uh, and the language uh, they learn their first language. Uh, number three, and, uh, this is the uh, third characteristic of uh, 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 characteristic of bilingualism: alteration. Uh, alternation. Uh, uh, bilingualism uh, also relates to the degree uh, to which the bilingual and his hearers have mastered both languages. Uh, determine the amount of alternation which takes place from one language to the other language. Uh, this in turn depends on his fluency in each language and on its external and internal functions that we have talked about. Uh, then uh, we need to know under what conditions does alternation from one language to another language uh, take place. Uh, take place. Uh, what are the factors involved uh, in, alterna in alternation? Uh, the three main factors seem to be topic, person and tension. So these are three uh, main factors uh, for the alternation I mean uh, from one language to the other language uh, which are uh, topic, person, and tension. Uh, rate and proportion of alternation, rate and proportion of alternation uh, may vary greatly in the same individual according to different things, uh, according to these following things, according to the topic about which he is speaking, uh, the person he is speaking to, and the tension of the situation in which he speaks. So, in uh, these three uh, uh, factors, so the rate and pro proportion of alternation will definitely greatly vary because of the topic. For one topic, the rate and proportion of alternation is different. And with one person, the rate and proportion of alternation from one language to the other is different and the tension in which attention of the situation in which is speaking uh, in different in different situations the rate and proportion of alternation would be uh, different uh, the fourth factor uh, fourth characteristic of uh, bilingualism is interference uh, 
the characteristics of degree, function, and alternation determine the interference of one language with another in the speech of bilinguals. Okay. The characteristics of degree, the characteristics of function, and the characteristics of alternation, they determine the interference of one language uh, with another uh, uh, in, in the speech of bilinguals. Interference is the use of features belonging to one language while speaking or writing another. So when how uh, uh, the first language interferes in speaking or writing the other language. This is interference. Uh, the, the description of interference must be distinguished from the analysis of language borrowing. Borrowing is different thing. And you know the interference is different thing. Borrow you just borrow one word, word of another language. That is another thing. But interference kind of, I mean, uh, in, let's say in speaking, I mean, you, uh, uh, your accent is different, uh, your pronunciation way is different. This is interference because your organs are set according to your mother tongue. So uh, they 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 find it difficult to uh, to pronounce. Uh, a new uh, new language or to they, they, they find it difficult to set as per the requirement of uh, the, the new language so uh, interference uh, is different from borrowing in this sense uh, the former is uh, you know the former the interference is uh, parole and later is uh, lang lang uh, the borrowing is lang Uh, the one is individual and uh, contingent, the other is collective and systematic. Uh, in contradiction to the consistency in use of borrowed features, and the speech of the community is the vacillation in the use of foreign features by bilingual individuals. Uh, in the speech of bilingual, Interference is not the same at all times and under all circumstances. The interference may vary with the medium, the style, the register, uh, and the context which the bilingual happens to be using. Uh, interference also varies with the style of discourse used, for example, descriptive, narrative, or conversational. So in all these uh, 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 styles of discourses, interference may also vary. Uh, uh, for example, uh, uh, the type and amount of interference noted in the recounting of an anecdote may differ considerably, considerably, uh, considerably from that noted in the give and take everyday conversation. The, the, the uh, amount uh, and type of interference and the storytelling would be different than uh, than everyday give and take conversation. So interference may also vary according to the social role of the speaker in any, any given uh, case. I mean, whatever the social role of the speaker is there, so the interference may also vary from person to person. Uh, this uh, is what the Edinburgh School has called register. Within each register, there are a number of possible contexts each of which may affect the type and amount of uh, interference depending on the context and interlocutor. Uh, in each of these contexts, the interference may vary from situation to situation. In the last analysis, interference varies from text to text. So it's the text, therefore, within a context or situation used at a specific register in a certain style and medium of a given dialect that is the appropriate sample for the description of interference. Thank you very much gentlemen. So here uh, we have a list of some of the cultural advantages of bilingualism. So you may read them, a couple of slides here only. Uh, uh, yes. Uh, only these two. 
assignment yet to come, so I will type it after I uh, pause this uh, uh, recording. And thank you very much. All the best. See you in next lecture very soon.